have been no park without Elkmont. There was a pretty direct conflict. Those cabins have no historical significance at all. We're destroying history for no reason. There's a lot of strong feelings. Elkmont will shine forever. We all need to understand this park didn't just fall out of heaven. Hey, I'm Jim Matheny in the Great Smoky Mountains, and this is the Elkmont Historic District. Now, a lot of folks know it for its big campground, a really popular set of hiking trails, and also wildlife, especially the synchronous fireflies. But Elkmont also has a history of conflict, controversy, and decades of arguments over whether the history here was worth saving at all. And for the next half hour, we're going to delve deep into that history in this special, Elkmont Will Shine. That's the name of an old song people used to sing at parties and also became a rallying cry to save Elkmont. We'll go in depth with rare film, home movies, and documents that show why some people are still so bitter about the fate of this community. But before we dive into all of that, first we just want to let you kind of get your bearings here at Elkmont and show you the lay of the land. This map shows 70 buildings in Elkmont in the early 1990s. You can break them down into four neighborhoods. First, you have the Wonderland Club with a dozen buildings, including the Wonderland Hotel. Head over to the Little River Trail and there's Millionaire's Row with 10 buildings. Just beside it, where the road loops around, that's Daisy Town. It has 22 buildings. And then running along Jake's Creek, you have 26 buildings in Society Hill. Now let's take you back to the spring of 2017, when crews were getting ready to tear down dozens of old cabins all along Little River Trail and Jake's Creek. A deadline for demolition looms in Elkmont. A final chance for pictures of a ghost town before it vanishes. So I look at these pictures and I look at the cabins now and it kind of hurts my heart. For Lynn Faust, the fight may be over, but the emotional wounds have not healed. She grew up coming to Elkmont, and so did her children at their family cabin along Little River Trail. This cabin has been called Spring Cottage for close to 100 years. Because there's a spring, it's beautiful, and that was our drinking water up until the 70s. Spring Cottage is on its last legs, but leaves a lasting legacy of illumination in Elkmont. It was from here that we first watched what was later to become the famous light show, which is the synchronous lightning bug display. Faust is now the leading expert on lightning bugs in the world. And that scientific journey began on this back porch, where she discovered the rare synchronous fireflies that now attract sold out crowds to Elkmont. We all just watched it and appreciated it, but we knew it was beautiful what we were watching. The private shows on the back porch ended in 1992 when the leases on these cabins and the Wonderland Hotel expired. People had to leave and the park was going to tear everything down. Once history is destroyed, it's gone forever. So a bitter battle began to preserve a piece of the past that created the present Great Smoky Mountains National Park. To save Elkmont and the story it has to tell, In the early 1900s, Elkmont really boomed when the Little River Lumber Company laid tracks across the mountain to harvest a treasure of tall timber. By early 1900s, Elkmont was the second largest town in Sevier County. The train opened direct access for logging and for travel. Knoxville's elite took the train for fun weekend trips in the once secluded wilderness. They formed the private Appalachian Club, built a clubhouse, and more than 70 vacation cottages. And so people would get on the logging train and ride up and get in the cool mountain air. We used to call it hillbilly air conditioning. You know, you go to the mountains for uh, the summer to, to cool off. Just next door, the new Wonderland Club Hotel gave the rest of the public a place to enjoy the same rarefied air of Elkmont. So at that time, you saw that first glimmer of early tourism. Here's the beautiful Elkmont Country brochure from 1915 trying to get people to come to the Smokies. And as logging companies clear-cut the trees and eventually started to clear out, 
Leaders in Elkmont wanted to save the scenery of the Smokies by making it a national park. Many of the people of the Elkmont Resort community were some of the first park advocates. And fascinating stories of the fights that took place at the Appalachian Club on where to put the park. All of that was hammered out in Elkmont. In 1934, the Great Smoky Mountains officially became a national park. The government was so grateful to David Chapman for his help, it gave him a cabin at Elkmont. You know, Chapman Highway is named for Colonel Chapman. But ironically, by creating the park, these people would have to give up their cabins. The government gave almost everyone in the park a choice. Sell your property for full price and leave immediately. Or sell for a discount and you can get a lifetime lease and stay here until you die. In Elkmont, a lifetime lease made sense. To get to use it longer was much more valuable to somebody where it was their summer cabin. Resentment grew among families who had to take the money and leave their homes behind, while the well-to-do could afford to stay. Some people have felt that people here had a financial advantage, so there were hard feelings. Hard feelings or not, the people in Elkmont were here for life. Elkmont was full of happy campers, a Wonderland hotel, and family cabins where a tight-knit community sang into the night. Elkmont will shine. Now that lifetime lease agreement, that's really pretty cut and dry. But coming up, we're going to explain how that agreement got a lot more complicated and also show you some offers that could have saved this community. When we continue, Elkmont will shine. When the Great Smoky Mountains became a national park, cabin owners here sold to the government cheap in exchange for a lifetime lease for them and their children. But in the early 1950s, this cut and dry arrangement got a lot more complicated because they wanted electricity. The utility company said it needed a 20 year guarantee the cabins would still be here to make it worth installing. So instead of being based on anyone's particular life, they said, okay, this will give us a time certain to amortize the investment of running electricity in there. So almost everyone changed their lease to expire in 20 years, 1972. That was extended again through the end of 1992. In the meantime, life went on as usual. Visitors enjoyed mountain air and country cooking at the Wonderland Hotel. And the hot chocolate and biscuits. Take your hot chocolate out on that porch and rock in the chairs and look at Blanket Mountain. And people from all around the country rolled into a new campground in Elkmont that opened in 1961. But not everyone here was a visitor. Some old timers lived here permanently, like J.T. Higdon who made a living taking care of the cabins. You're the caretaker here? How many people hey. live up here now? You mean you around? Yeah. Me and my sister and uh, the Rangers. <laughs> J.T. Higdon, who some of my fondest memories are listening to him sing Out Mont Will Shine at the end of every party. In 1982, the park made it clear. No Elkmont leases would be extended again. And the park had a clear plan demolish all 70 buildings that were here before the Great Smoky Mountains became a national park. They were built in the 1910s at the time of the park's establishment in 1934. These would not have been considered historic. Many of them have just these very simple rock foundations. Even the Wonderland Hotel was built only on stacked stone. While the cabins had wear and tear, photos in 1992 show they were in good shape but they were doomed nonetheless. Some tried to get another extension to keep their cabins. Others accepted they would have to leave, but wanted the park to open their cabins up to the public, not tear them down. Just whether I was gonna be there or not, I was sorry the history of it, that that was dying along with it. When something's torn down, it's gone. But there was another side that felt just as strong, Environmental groups wanted the cabins gone to return this land to nature. They wanted this private enclave of Elkmont erased. Many of the early park descendants 
felt that these lease arrangements were a slap in the face for what they went through vacating the park. It was a totally polarized situation. Elkmont will shine forever. Some cabin holders held out hope. Dad, hey Pixie. But also prepared to say goodbye, documenting their dear community before it was demolished. That's a Matthews cabin. They had big parties and sang a familiar tune. We had all cried and kissed it goodbye in 1992. When the leases expired, the people of Elkmont begged to at least let J.T. Higdon stay. He lived here almost his whole life. He was practically blind, and they would pay for all of his expenses. The park made no exceptions. J.T. and his sister Midge were loaded up, driven out, away from their home and their way of life. J.T. Higdon died four years later. The end of Elkmont seemed certain, but soon there was a twist. The cabins and the Wonderland Hotel got a lifeline when they were put on the National Register of Historic Places, and the park had to reconsider its plan. And everybody went, you're kidding. With the future of the cabins up in the air, Faust and other families wanted to pay to keep their old buildings in top shape until a decision was made. The park said no. Demolition by neglect was allowed to occur. If a tree falls on it, makes a hole in the roof, no one does anything. It was heartbreaking. Some accused the park of stalling to let the buildings fall apart. But the park was actually weighing several options and letting the public chime in. Those cabins have no historical significance at all. They should be removed. I would like to see that whole community preserved. We're in favor of the most natural solution, us fireflies, which would be remove the cabins and restore the native plant life. The Park Service cannot get enough money up to rebuild them, and if it could, it would be a waste of money. While the public argument centered on money, documents show funding was really not the issue. A study paid for by the park said operating these cabins would quickly pay for itself. Money was never really a problem. Very clear offers from local philanthropists to save Elkmont for public use. That includes an offer never reported. In 2001, Sandy Bell, the founder of Ruby Tuesday and Blackberry Farm, one of the highest rated resorts in the country, offered to renovate and operate the Wonderland Hotel. Bell's letter says he would invest up to $15 million, make sure the environment was not damaged, and save history without costing the park. Bell's offer was ignored. The park never opened up any commercial bids because it said that type of operation was not necessary with so many places to stay in nearby cities. At the time the park was created was not to build grand lodges inside the national park because they wanted to provide some benefit from the tourism for our local communities. Ultimately, the Park Service came up with seven different options for Elkmont that ranged from saving all the buildings, saving some, or tearing everything down. Meanwhile, the cabins were vandalized. People come in and trash it. That make you sad, kind of? Make me mad. <laughs> and part of the Wonderland Hotel collapsed. So in 2006, crews tore it down. Now, after years of delays and decay, the park was finally set to make a decision on what to do with these old cabins at Elkmont. Coming up, we'll explain their choice, knowing at least one side, maybe all sides, would not be happy. Hey, welcome back to the WBIR special, Elkmont Will Shine. I'm Jim Athene in the Great Smoky Mountains, where the National Park Service debated for a decade and a half what to do with these old vacation cabins in Elkmont, more than 70 of them. The park had a change of heart about the value of Elkmont's past. 
There was a perception in the park for many years that the only real history here was about the pioneers, the people who built log cabins. I think we recognized over the years that the recreational use of this area as weekend retreats was kind of a sidebar to that history. In 2006, the park announced its choice for these 70 buildings, a compromise nobody was asking for. Restore 19 buildings shown in yellow and tear down the rest, but not let anyone spend the night in them. The park service was trying to essentially thread the needle. And at the end of the day, neither side got what they wanted in its entirety, but we feel like this is the best balance. The end result, 19 cabins. Two of them you can rent during the day for events. The rest, empty museum exhibits. The choice was made, but the park said it could only afford to chip away at this project a little bit at a time. By 2012, crews had removed four cabins in Daisytown, put in new parking lots, and restored the two places you can rent during the day, Spence Cabin and the Appalachian Clubhouse. People have a lot of different gatherings, lots of weddings here, and really have some nice events. Oakmont will shine tonight, Oakmont will shine. While seeing the clubhouse saved was something to sing about. The cabins continue to rot while the park waits for funding. Fowl says that's throwing money away because the old cabins have materials that could help pay for the whole project. The buildings are full of hardwoods and American chestnut, a rare and valuable lumber a treasure that will never be replaced. As a taxpayer, that bothers me. Now the National Park Service says it did salvage everything it could from those old cabins. Lynn Faust obviously disagrees. Whatever the case, there's no doubt crews were about to make some significant progress on this prolonged project. Coming up after the break, we're gonna show you the demolition and the restoration in the conclusion of Elkmont Will Shine. Well, it took decades of bitter debate for the National Park Service to finally decide what to do with dozens of historic cabins in Elkmont. Their final decision was a compromise. Save 19 of the cabins, including the Appalachian Clubhouse, tear down the rest, and chip away at the project over time. And in 2017, the Park Service was able to take a big chip off Elkmont's to-do list. Back then, when something like this was built, there was no modern tools and you can just think about what they had to go through. Delane Hodges works as a restoration expert for the National Park Service. I think it's important to keep history. And he was given the task to save four cabins falling apart in the heart of Elkmont. It was quite a challenge. This whole uh, fireplace and chimney, we rebuilt it from ground up. There was no windows in some of these uh, open holes. I had to make them from scratch. And restoring these cabins that meant so much to generations of families. Well, that became an emotional investment for Hodge's family. And his wife pitched in for free. She volunteers. She's, a, she's actually a professional painter. All these windows and all these houses she preserved. And now four cabins are complete. And people are free to walk inside and step into the past. At the Creekmore cabin, the Mayo servants' quarters, the Levi Trenum cabin that goes back to 1830, and the old Mayo Cottage. It almost looks like brand new. I'm real proud that the visiting public's gonna get to see them in this condition rather than that condition. We put our heart and souls into it, we really did. You let things just disappear, then future generations won't even know what was even here or existed beforehand. Now, so far, the Park Service has restored six of the 19 cabins it's going to save here in Elkmont. But along with all this restoration, 2017 also brought demolition, and many cabins finally met their fate. It's heartbreaking. Lynn Faust visits a dying family member for one last time. Just many good times here, many good times. After 25 years of arguing to save the cabins for public lodging and watching them slowly die in the process, heavy equipment finally prepares to put Spring Cottage out of its misery. And yes, it has been like losing a loved one for the past 25 years, but it's gone on so long now, we're almost <laughs> fond of the decaying relatives. Since 1934, this day was inevitable. The cabins belonged to leaders who created the National Park and kept their cabins with a lifetime lease, knowing their beloved community would end in someone's lifetime. We all have families. We have children, we have grandchildren, and they become attached to the place the same way that we were. 
And so a life estate doesn't actually prevent the sense of separation, it just delays it. There has to be an end point, but it doesn't make it less painful. While Faust and other families may consider demolition a defeat, without their decades of determination, all of these buildings and the story they share would have disappeared. I guess there's a little bit of solace that a few empty shells of cabins will remain. And the restoration and rentals of the Appalachian Clubhouse and Spence Cabin mean more than a century of romance will continue to burn bright here. As others exchange vows and develop a deep love for this destination. So Faust bids farewell with love notes on lumber and apologies to Spring Cottage. The sentimental send-off even touches the rugged crew members who tear this place apart. Elmont touches everybody. And I just don't want Elmont to be forgotten or for people in the future to think Elmont is just those structures when there was an entire huge community. But most will simply never know that something very important was here. A community with a story of train tracks, timber, and the creation of the most visited national park in the country. Spring Cottage may be gone, but no apologies are needed. Faust and others already saved Elkmont. Now many of these old cabins are gone forever. The only thing left are chimneys that stand as tall tombstones. But thanks to the help of a lot of former cabin owners, we were able to help preserve their memories. You can find a collection of hundreds of photos of each and every building in Elkmont through the years. And those extensive photo galleries are at WBIR's website and also on social media. And as long as people understand this place's past, I believe they'll care about its future and Elkmont will shine. For WBIR 10 News, I'm Jim Matheny. Thanks for watching.